Please take your seats so we can get started. Before we start with the uh, honorary lecture for this year, I would like to announce the winner for next year's Distinguished Lecture Award. That winner is Joe Donnelly. <laughs> next year. <laughs> Somebody wants to talk first. This year's winner, or last year's winner to speak this year, is Dr. Timothy Flynn. We don't have time to cover all of his bio, so we're going to go through some specifics. One is a, another past president of the Academy, as well as an, an associate editor of the JOSBT. Dr. Flynn has been widely published and a passionate teacher whose scholarship and teaching excellence have received numerous awards. An award he hasn't received, if you've been to the banquets, he probably needs some kind of a dancing award as well. <laughs> His current appetite is in trying to slow the overutilization of imaging, drugs, and surgery in the management of musculoskeletal disorders by advocating for a physical therapist first solution. Currently, he's a professor of the School of Physical Therapy at the South College in Knoxville, Tennessee, a principal of Evidence in Motion. He maintains an active clinical practice focusing on chronic musculoskeletal pain in Colorado, uh, in, in, at Colorado in Motion, Fort Collins, Colorado. Tim is tireless, infectious, and driven, truly worthy of this award. Tim Flynn. All right, somebody got Neil. You could have kept playing that and then I could just stand and listen. So I need to make sure my technology works. Um, I'm humbled, I'm honored. Uh, I've been looking forward to this, doing this, having the opportunity to do this. And I blogged about this with this title, Why I Left Medicine in America, and everybody thought I retired. I'm serious. I'm like, do you quit? What did you quit for? No, I didn't quit. Um, not at all. Uh, it just that we're, we truly are at a crossroads. You know, it was tough to come this year, though, I have to admit, because we've had a spectacular fall in Colorado. The leaves have been just stunning, and they've been that, and we were talking about that. I was talking with Patty up in Evergreen. It's been, been beautiful, and of course, in Colorado, it usually stays evergreen uh, a good part of the year. Um, so... <laughs> that, um, so I shouldn't be surprised the green has stayed as long as it has this fall. Um, but nonetheless, I'm here actually to talk a little bit about this concept of pain, which is the number one reason phys people seek care uh, for a physical therapist, one of the number one reasons anyone seeks care in the medical system. And the International Association for the Study of Pain provided this outstanding definition, which really I think you need to read slowly because it is who we are and what we do. An unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential, actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. So I want you to step back for a moment and uh, just get pumped up after lunch for a second.
You know, most of those um, crafts move a little faster than some of the uh, ones of earlier times. But you'd say that most of the people that were on there or in there, in those cockpits, probably are used to a little bit of danger. I was fortunate to grow up with one of these uh, crazy uh, aviators named John Patrick Flynn, who was my father, who took one of these a little less of an airplane, um, had a lot of torque at the time, but they would land these propellers, single engine propellers onto aircraft carriers. So probably was used to intensity, used to um, and high uh, stress-induced environments. Um, he also was given the name Chief, uh, not in, in a derogatory term, he's Native American, and he was truly a leader of men, and he was a chief among those that he was fortunate enough uh, to lead. Um, he also is a mischievous guy, and I think, I'm not sure where I, if I inherited any of that at all, but this is him in the, you know, in the uh, midst of the depression with his pet uh, wolf uh, that was, he had in the, the barren lands of South Central South Dakota on the edge of the Rosebud Reservation. Um, so fast forward though, um, we had moved back to South Dakota and you know, being from South Dakota, you ended up being either, most people were Minnesota Vikings fans. And uh, um, you know, my father was indeed a Minnesota Vikings fan, but I was uh, given Vince Lombardi's two volume time life set on Vince Lombardi on football. So I was actually a Packer fan, but this was a typical Sunday afternoon in the Flynn house, go Pack. Uh, a typical Sunday afternoon in the Flynn house would be in front of the TV for the Central Division game and my father all excited and usually by you know midway through the second quarter was fast asleep and in, in the chair um, of course being mischievous myself I thought that uh, early on I was about five or six I I um, was sitting there playing on the floor watching the game in and out and you know how sometimes things loom large and what loomed large was next to my head was my father's feet uh, that were unshod, no shoes on, barefoot. And so I quietly uh, walked up next to him there and proceeded to tickle his feet. And my father jumped up screaming, going towards his groin and, and yelling, yelling, and my mom coming out of the corner saying, what did you do? Never, never touch your father like that again. And I guess it was kind of that first memory that, you know, the first, when you begin to realize maybe it's a little bit different. At that time, didn't know my father had been a POW for 18 months and had, so, uh, being a pilot, high value targets, they were, suffered a lot of uh, things that were unpleasant and including solitary confinement and the like. And I then, I guess, started to realize this idea of, you know, perceived threat and that mischief or mischief can be a cause or source of harm evil or irritation. And looking back now, you know, as I got a little bit older and things would be shared in the, in the garage of South Dakota where I grew up in the shed, my father was a very creative type and he would uh, uh, make these, uh, uh, for, he was commissioned to do uh, Stations of the Cross for this small church in South Dakota. And he was welding things together, painting things, uh, taking metal, shaping it, and making kind of these 3D images that he would put uh, as uh, stations on the cross. And I remember, you know, he, he had barbed wire and he was creating this crown of thorns with barbed wire and very quietly and, and um, saying, you know, why did you do that, Dad? And uh, saying, you know, son, things are used where they should not be. And it, it struck me and then he went on and to something else and talked about something else and like he always would do. But I realized the first understanding really of pain and threat and perceived threat and indeed how embedded certain parts of the body are within our sensory cortex and how those experiences continue and are with us throughout life. You know, fast forward, uh, Pam Mom John, that man looks very, very happy being, you know, a lot of uh, stones weight less weight, but a very happy man as he came across. But I did realize the beginnings of this idea of, you know, pain. It's really an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential experience 
or actual or potential tissue damage or described in such terms. You know, we're at a crossroads. We really are. The modern U.S. medical industrial complex has created, promoted, and sustained an epidemic in pain. I repeat, the modern medical industrial complex has done this. And we have to decide what we're going to do about it. Let's back up and say when the most recent story has played out. In 1996, when Purdue Pharmaceutical released OxyContin onto the market. And they introduced, the, the, at that time, the American Pain Society introduced the phrase, phrase pain as the fifth vital sign. We must measure it. We must, it became a disease in and of itself. And, of course, in true American fashion, you know, here we go, something comes out to say, hey, well, we can fix that, we can dial that down, no problem whatsoever. Well, here's the science, which thanks for the setup this morning. Here was a science that said, oh, by the way, this heroin is not addictive. No evidence of addiction rates, and that was passed to physician office after physician office after physician office after medical school after medical school. If you actually looked at it, they cited this quote-unquote paper, a paragraph, not even a letter to the aircraft, a letter to the editor, a paragraph in the New England Journal of Medicine, which described in a hospitalized patients, primarily post-surgical, being monitored within the hospital system, that immediate post-operatively we could use these type of drugs and they could be safe and not have addiction. I would argue that's a little bit of a leap to take which was a non-peer-reviewed, unpublished study and create an entire industry out of it. But I digress. We've sustained it. That's when it started, but we sustained it. We sustained it as recently as 2009 and, and beyond. American Geriatric Society in 2009, with, by the way, the panel of, of its experts were uh, uh, five out of six uh, were tied to the pharmaceutical industry. They, of course, said, although the evidence is limited, they concluded that chronic opioid therapy can be an effective therapy for carefully selected and monitored patients with chronic non-cancer pain. Now, this is what it looks like when we come to this USA Today here, looking at the number of seniors that are using potent drugs, and it's staggering. This is what happens in America. Please, our international speakers, you have time to leave. <laughs> well, nearly one in three Medicare beneficiaries received an opioid prescription in 2015. Repeat that again. One in three Medicare beneficiaries received an opioid prescription. We are not leaders, however. There's only one country that is actually using more than us per capita, and it's north of us, but it's colder there. <laughs> so having said that, again, the U.S. has less than 5% of the world's population, but consumes over 80% of the world's opioid supply. One in four patients given a prescription will go on to chronic abuse. One in four. We beat ourselves up. We freak out about if we move people a little too much, we're going to harm them. And we're giving people one out of four who said, hey, you're going to get addicted. Take this. It's outrageous. It's outrageous. Here's what it looks like. 44 Americans die from a prescription painkiller overdose every day in America. 44, prescription overdose, okay? If you take a look at that graph, it's the prescriptions that are leading. More recently, as unable to get that, heroin starting to come up, black tar heroin that's, that's uh, being used as a substitute. There is a green line on the bottom there. <laughs> and interestingly, we'll talk about more is, hmm, why are those states' rates going down in certain states where that is it there? Interesting enough, guess where money's flowing from Big Pharma? There's stuff on the ballot in Arizona. And what's happening now is they're pulling money into the, the ballot to try to keep it off because, oh, by the way, we have, a, we have something we can sell. Okay. Essentially, they're the same company that had an oral spray of fentanyl, which, as you know, is 
deadly, lethal type of drug. The painkiller lobby is eight times the size of the gum lobby. Over the past decade, 880 million has been spent lobbying, eight times more than gun lobby, 200 times the spending of groups advocating for stricter opioid prescription rules. Okay. Financially, we're at a bit of a disadvantage. Uh, of course, you all are, you're all pay, how many, everybody's having an increasing pay as physical therapists, right? Copays are going down and reimbursements going up. Come on, raise your hands, right? You know? I mean, think about it. Uh, so again, we're getting, cutting reimbursements for the things that, that, are, that don't kill you, okay? Making greater regulatory things, bar burdens and barriers for the things that don't kill you, yet it's easy and, and easy to get something that one in four chance you might go on to addiction and perhaps to death. The number on reason, I don't know if any of you guys treat a condition called low back pain. It's a condition often seen by physical therapists, and it's the number one reason for an opioid prescription given in this country. Well, knowing what we know now, I'm sure that the, this is changing, this is old news, right? Because we're starting to see it. Well, this spine paper demonstrated, published in 2016, just last couple months ago. Follow this out here, if I can. Um, what you'll see is on this graph, you're seeing the number of low back pain visits on the y-axis, axis, and then you're seeing years across the x-axis. Look at over the last uh, decade, over a decade, 12, 13 years, they followed this, 14 years, you know, uh, PT percent referral rates are going down, opioid prescriptions dramatically. Look where we started in 97. We're, as usual, in about that time, probably ACPA guidelines were coming out and PTs were flagellating themselves, beating themselves up. We have no value, nothing works, we're, we're a piece of crap, et cetera, et cetera. And yet we got people selling sickness on a paragraph from New England Journal of Medicine. And we're inside our little thing, worrying about getting reimbursed, talking to each other, saying, oh, we're so low on the totem pole, we have nothing to offer society. And look what happened. Look where we're at today. That's, that's astounding in, in my mind. It's beyond, it's beyond the pale. You know, the modern U.S. medical industrial complex created, promoted, and sustained this epidemic in pain. But we have to ask ourselves, can we fix it? You know, the science behind it is easy. We know that these things work. We know that teaching people about pain, providing hands-on care, listening, exercise as a drug, it is a drug, exercise as medicine, yoga, mindfulness, actually caring for someone, it works. And it doesn't have the side effects of death. But unfortunately, where you start is where you end. You know, they often say in real estate geography is destiny. When it comes to healthcare and musculoskeletal pain, you know, its provider is destiny. And if you go down that pathway into the medical industrial complex, things can get ugly pretty quickly. If you happen to be fortunate enough to see a physical therapist early, at the, and particularly at the point of entry, things look different, very different. So what is the data behind this? You guys are familiar with this work, but just to lay it out a bit, you know, some work that I was fortunate enough to be involved with, Dr. Fritz, uh, Julie, as you know, she's in the audience. We are so indebted to her as a, as a professional uh, and what she is, the data that we now have uh, in, in front of us. Um, we know that, you know, just first of all, that back when we looked at this data, only 7% of patients with low back pain received a physical therapy uh, visit within 90 days, 7%. So we'll continue to fight with our colleagues down the street in PT, or f perhaps fight with the chiros, f fight with this or that, yell at each other because you don't have this initial after your name, that you're not as good as the other person, et cetera, et cetera. And we have 93% of market share that doesn't even know we exist. The other thing is, if you actually see someone, fortunate enough, you're gonna have decreased imaging, physician visits, surgeries, injections, and opioid use compared to those that go that see a, phys a physical therapist at a delayed point of time. 
So this really looked at point, time of care, and what you, this is just graphically showing the odds ratio of these things happening. If someone encounters a physical therapist early in their course of low back pain versus if it's later in the course of low back pain. Now, because that data set was small, um, it was done again with a larger data set. No, that's not actually why. Uh, but this data set was even larger. So this, uh, within the uh, DOD beneficiary population, took a small sample of uh, three quarters of a million uh, episodes of care, and then looked at how many received, with low back pain, how many received physical therapy. Of that, 16% received PT. So in that system, uh, it was better than what we reported earlier in the third-party payment system in that database, so about 16%. However, of those, only about 60% got early physical therapy versus, you know, 40% with delayed physical therapy. Now, you ask yourself, which one would you rather be? It's pretty easy to make that decision. If you see a PT early in your course of care, this is your trajectory. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that those co confidence intervals are incredibly narrow and that, that, that is, those are dramatic reductions in the odds of you ever using an opioid, ever getting a needle stuck in your back, ever getting a knife stuck in your back or put into a tube uh, that is not therapeutic. That's an MRI. So <laughs> there's no levity in the house. So, so it's actually pretty straightforward what the decision is. And we, we now see a campaign coming forward and, you know, th this Choose PT and really trying to get the message forward that we need to be upfront earlier. And let's quit arguing with each other and start understanding we have a greater role in society. Um, this isn't what hap is happening. 2013 JAMA, let's look at this one here, which is looking at worsening trends in the management and treatment of back pain. And again, what do you see here? You see on the top, top uh, line there in red is the narcotics. You see um, increasing narcotics use. You see increasing radiographic use. And where's physical therapy? It is going down. From 2000 to 2010, there's actually less utilization of physical therapy for the management of back pain. Let me repeat that. Less utilization of physical therapy for the management of back pain over the decade. And then we're getting advanced imaging as it's having a good revival, right? CT and MRIs continue to be going up. And again, they're not therapeutic magnets, okay? Those MRIs are not designed for therapeutic magnets. You know, but let's, let's step back because I think if we're going to embrace this, we have a greater role in society. And it's not just pain where we're seeing these, these problems. I mean, if you look at foot balance and falls, another area, this is just a graph that shows on the bottom the number of medicines taken. And then as you look on the y-axis, it's the number of possible interactions that you will have with those medications. You know? And we're seeing patients with, you know, regularly with the likelihood of having, you know, you know, we're not even, they haven't even studied these interactions, and we have a cocktail of, of, of just crap in our body, and we don't know what this cocktail does in all its interaction effects. But we sell it well. We sell it really well, because half of all of us are on some type of prescription drug. The average in America is five different drugs per person. Five. Okay. Unfortunately, the one drug that could probably help them the most, called exercise, is often given as, oh, you should do something. Okay. Well, let's look at our favorite, and one of the favorite statin drugs, um, you know, which many of our patients are coming in, and you have these bizarre aches and pains, and you're, you're doing the best you can. Um, how effective are these? Let's look at those people that take these that don't have known, high, known heart disease. There are millions of people taking these drugs without known heart disease. They have a risk factor called, you know, high cholesterol. Okay? You know, I have a risk factor. Guess what? I'm more likely to die now than I was the decade before. Okay? I'm getting a little older. Okay? <laughs> My likelihood is going up. Okay? Again, so these are, they have no known heart disease. The number, here's the number needed to treat, right? How many people do you give this to to try to help? 
Well, none, no lives have been saved in this study. Nobody actually, life was saved. One in one in four prevented a heart attack. So the other 103 get the side effect for that one to get a heart attack prevention. One in 154 were helped uh, preventing a stroke. Now you say, well, maybe that's pretty decent. Those are big, big, uh, you know, big events. That's the same benefit as a Mediterranean diet. Okay. Which Mediterranean diet doesn't have this, that one in 100 people given a statin drug who develops diabetes. One in 100. Okay. One in 10 were harmed, i.e. muscle damage or, and or pain. And some suggest it's even higher than that, that develop muscle symptoms to the severe side being rhabdomyolysis. But, you know, again, whatever happened to risks and benefits and slowly weighing that? But we've been here before, okay? This, this has been here before, and it's not new. We frequently, and I, some might say arrogantly, prescribe medicine to unsuspecting populations. I knew of a man who, who, you know, life was designed that stress was part of it. That's what made it life work. That's what you did because you're hyper-focused on things. And you have to sometimes be that way. And certain things in your life probably create greater risk for, you know, ending up having a heart attack, which my father did fairly young. But what did they do back then? You know, oh, you're too stressed. So let's give an Irish Native American Marine Corps aviator who typically, you know, 60s, you know, drinking cocktails after flight was normal, um, and that behavior continues, let's give them Valium because they're stressed, and stress is going to help your heart attack. No fake. And that was commonly done in the 70s. Ah, stress, you're having a heart attack because you're stressed. Okay. So again, we look back, and yet we know now, I mean, we can actually change cardiovascular health by having participants reappraise or rethink arousal. You know, that essentially looking at things as less, less threatening actually can change their cardiovascular risk status. Okay. It doesn't get paid in the same way the pharmaceutical industry does. Okay. You know, my father's last heart attack, uh, um, this is a picture of Flynn Field, you know, they, they named the local airport after him after he passed away. And, uh, but in, in, in fairness, one of my greatest memories uh, is the last time I really saw my father alive, where he was fortunate enough to take one final ride. And, and my mom, classic Irish Catholic, um, you know, get it done kind of woman, called, you know, and somehow got the National Guard to come and, you know, and pick him up and take him to the, the, the Sioux Falls VA hospital. And that was the last smile I ever saw from my father because it was like, you know, one final ride. He, he, I, I, he knew his mortality. And I think in, at 17, I did too, because he was always open about life. You know, to be fair, it's not just the pharmaceutical industry. This was mentioned this morning. I mean, the ultimate placebo, that of surgery, and we, we look at that, especially when it comes to musculoskeletal pain. And frankly, what many of us and how we learned and how we viewed this mechanical system of the body and that we treat it with mechanical means. Okay, but before they go there, I'd really like to step back and have us peer a little deeper because how do we get there? How do we actually get to a knife in the back? And it really starts with imaging. And we ask ourselves, what is the purpose of imaging? You know, it has to discriminate between competing disorders and serve to guide therapeutic decision making. And above all else, it has to impact the outcome of interest. And this is a passion of mine because I look at this. I look at this, and what do you see? Is, are we really looking at wrinkles on the inside? And when the heck did normal aging become a disease? When did we make a disease out of change in how our skin and internal organs and spine and knees, et cetera, change? You know, how did we get there? Okay, we know this. This is old data. We know that the, the relationship between MRI and CT findings in people with low back pain. You know, pick your age and know what you got. If you don't have back pain, again, none of these people have back pain, and we have these findings, okay? Change is normal. Wrinkles on the inside are normal, okay? 
The same in, even if that wrinkle is, is actually related to the physical and history examination, like in this uh, case, uh, New England Journal earlier this year, where clearly that's a pretty honking, uh, you know, narrowed canal, wouldn't you say, there on the left? And yet, that resolved, it's, uh, six months later, they took another image, okay? Didn't have surgery. It, it resolved, okay? Yes, we do get wrinkles, and yes, you know, I'm, we're not up here saying someone is having severe neurological deficits, it's, that spine surgery isn't an appropriate consideration, not the least. But even in severe cases, many times a single, simple thing called the body's ability to repair itself happens. But we see that everywhere. I'm just going to go through here quickly. Shoulder pain, asymptomatic shoulders, 96% have uh, f uh, abnormal findings um, uh, in asymptomatic, non-painful shoulders. Uh, when it comes to knee pain, meniscal tears, you know, more common in men than women as we age. Again, wrinkles on the inside. It's a common, a common thing as we, as we are fortunate enough to live, to live life. Um, happens not just in our moving or weight-bearing structures. It happens out into the periphery as well, into our wrists, and we have changes in people, again, asymptomatic individuals that are having, um, being imaged, and we see changes within the internal matrix of the body. And it'd be one thing if, again, it's fun to peer in. It's new, right? It's new technology. We like to look inside, you know? We're just not used to looking there, okay? It's a new frontier. And we bring the biases of this world as we peer inside the other world. And it's fine if it's not without, if there's no risk involved with it. But there are risks when that decision is made. Lumbar spine CT scans result in an increased risk of cancer. MRIs lead to higher rates of surgical intervention, three times higher than a radiograph, okay? And above all else, do no harm, right? This is the estimated number of CT scans performed annually in the United States. That is on the, uh, excuse me, on the y-axis, that is in millions. So 60 million in 2007 CT scans performed. Now, do not hear me say that those, many of those were not absolutely appropriate and life-altering in a positive way. But we have to realize that on the flip side, these are lumbar CT scans in 2007. There were 2.2 million of them. Out of those, we then created 1,200 new cases of cancer due to that radiation. 700 on the female side, 500 on the male side. This is a well-done study, projected conservatively. They did, you know, it was, it was well conducted. So this was a projected number of medically induced cancers due to CT scanning. Now, I started by saying, how did we get here? You know, we, we image, and then we're more likely to do something. You guys have heard my shtick on this. I don't want to go overboard, but for the newbies and students in the house, you know, uh, you know, we're doing way too much fusion in the United States, and we're doing it on older and older people, and we're causing harm. And we're spending a lot of money um, in fusion, more than we spend on uh, cancer research in this country, uh, in uh, following U.S. Direct, uh, direct aid. And, you know, one of the most damning, you know, it was, it was not a randomized controlled trial, but truly the most damning one was the Washington State uh, workers' compensation group where they had spi uh, workers that got spinal fusion compared to a low back pain control group of workers. And what they found was any time they ended up getting a fusion, one in four had a chance of repeat surgery. So, oh, by the way, I might have a look back in there again. So, got a 25% chance. Oh, by the way, you got a 33% chance, you know, of, you know, having a serious complication. But the good news is you never got to work again. At least three out of four, you're never going to work again. Um, but you're also more likely to die if you have this fusion. But, um, you know, I'm just letting you know. Uh, of course, that's usually not what's let known. Well, here's what the final uh, word here. This is looking at conservative versus surgical care. Um, 2016 study looks at the long-term outcome to 12, out at 12 years. This is Yas Westry. I would argue that neither of those groups are doing well. They're both above 30. Um, 
But the conservative group, uh, the, the care they got, again, it's kind of like they got conservative care, which means drugs may or may not have a PT anywhere in sight, um, was not do contemporary care by any means. Um, and you couple that with this, you know, even if you go to four different surgeons, you're going to get at least three different answers. You know, this is a paper recently published in Spine this year that showed substantial disagreement among surgeons on the approach to treat patients with low back pain. Those in academic practices were actually um, tend to be more conservative. So the actual academic institutions were more conservative. So when you're referring people, keep that in mind. Um, compared to hybrid and private practice uh, surgeons. Okay. But again, for something like given the same imaging, same history and physical exam, you'd think there'd be some agreement on what you should do with that patient, wouldn't you? Especially if it involves putting someone under anesthesia, cutting their back open, screwing things in, hammering things, cutting things out. You'd like to have reasonable disagreement. Louis dis is disagreeing with me in the front row, but I'm not going let him, to let him go there. Okay, well, consensus at last for those who have seen this, you know, long-term results of three RCTs in the UK and Norway found no evidence for superiority of surgery at the 11-year follow-up. Um, and it reminds me that this surgery, we've been here before, you know, we always think we're so smart and, you, and that we're smarter than the generation before, right? Definitely when we're younger, we think that. Come on, we'd always believe that. And Moniz, this was the letter of support actually received for the Nobel Prize. You know, it was a great therapeutic step forward. You know, it was a great therapeutic step forward. And he won the Nobel Prize for the, the lobotomy. And really, is spinal fusion the lobotomy of our time? You know, many people thought it was the right thing. Everybody agreed, let's do it. It helps, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the modern U.S. medical industrial complex has cre created, promoted, and sustained an epidemic in imaging and surgical management of low back pain. And we have to ask ourselves, can we fix it? Can we fix it? We have the data. If you get an MRI first, rather than seeing your physical therapist, you're six times more likely to go on to have surgery, five times more likely to go on to have an injection, and four times more likely to have an ER visit. Where you start is where you end up. Where you start is where you end up. If you're, even in a, if you're already really bad and we randomize you to go surgery or non-surgery, you still look the same. But even in uh, this trial, um, the, the bottom line is, at a minimum, you should be offered rigorous standardized PT. You know, if you're considering the knife, at a minimum, um, because those who do not, those who get that improve, and even if you have surgery, you're going to be better off on the outcome. Okay. Now, uh, again, some, some names continue to come up that we're indebted to that, you know, when you look at uh, the relook of the sport trial, which was a big deal, but essentially if we look at physical therapy, if those people actually got physical therapy, they, the likelihood of them crossing over to surgery after one year was less. You know, if you got PT within the mix, you had better functioning at six months and one year, whether you had surgery or not. PT in the mix was a good thing. Yet, out of these are people that are going on to, you know, major surgery for lumbar spinal stenosis, and only a third, you know, have PT. I mean, that is just mind boggling, okay? Mind boggling. Again, quit arguing among ourselves. That's even two thirds market share that you have. I mean, quit arguing about uh, ourselves and let's get out of this, this, this area. Okay. The medical industrial complex created, promoted, and sustained this epidemic of over-imaging, over-surgerizing, and over-prescribing opioids to manage musculoskeletal pain. Just Changes always happen when individuals said enough is enough and acted. Or as Gandhi once said, silence becomes cowardice when occasion demands speaking out the whole truth and acting accordingly. It really is time. It's time we all roll up our sleeves and do the hard work of forcing change. Thank you. 
professionals and part of the oath and the, uh, and the ethics that we bring upon is to speak that truth to power and to say if we see within our system, within our society, where people are being harmed, harmed to the point of death by things that we are doing, we have to speak that out. When it comes to the point now we kill more uh, people in Colorado, for instance, with opioid prescriptions than we do in motor vehicle accidents. I mean, that, that, how can we not be outraged by that? But as I often say, I believe that change, it's a societal problem, and that conversation has to happen to community members, to expose them when they see the data. Well, I often say data doesn't change behavior. We know that on many levels, but when you trust someone, and you listen to that person, and they come from a, a, a position of trust, which people trust their physical therapist. So this is when you take a picture of screen and make sure you can tweet it inside our little AMP app, which has a, a ability to tweet out. Make sure you know that feature, which I didn't know. Otherwise, preferably tweet it out on to your Twitter, social media. Throw it, make sure you get our hashtag AMP2016. I know the National Student Conclave is happening, so where's the students in the house? I want you all to be getting everyone in Student Conclave going crazy as well. And uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, that's where that video is, is housed. Um, and I'll, there'll some thank yous afterwards from some folks that did that. So, you know, I'd like to end with a, um, you know, since it's been such an upbeat uh, presentation, <laughs> You know, to end uh, on, on this note, you know, to say this, that indeed we are in health care. You know, we are in care. That's who we are. That's who we are as physical therapists. We love what we do. You know, what we're missing, what we're missing in society, what we're missing in, in pain is people like us. Quit making darn excuses and do what we do best. Care and grow practices, grow each other and start doing what needs to be done. So I'm going to leave you with, you know, we really are in the right profession at the right time. And I, I'd actually ask you now um, to maybe put your phones down for, if you could give me three more minutes of your time and take a deep breath, sit back and just listen and acknowledge why we are doing this anyway.
sunsets, in midnights, in cups of coffee, in inches, in miles, in laughter and strife, in 
killing people left and right. And the two leading causes were opium and co cocaine. So society, even then, was screaming, someone else help us. So I think we've got that right now too. So what are the roadblocks maybe we have right now preventing us from hearing the voices of millions of people who want us to help them? How, do we, how are we blocking ourselves from people who are probably already looking for us? You say, 7% getting to us, but how are we actually, we already are the resource, but people don't know it. And is there ways that we stop ourselves from being used in a better, in a better fashion? Uh, you know, it's thanks for, yeah, I love history and how, you know, again, you, you, you framed it better than I. We're our own worst enemies. We always have been. We'll spend more time arguing amongst ourselves and saying that if we wiggle this quicker or slower, then therefore, you know, this person will get better. And we fail to see our biggest strength in front of it. And I'm, I was part of that. Don't, don't get me wrong. Um, I think that, you know, I'm ever hopeful, and that's why I always stay in DPT education, in that, you know, the passion and the connectedness and the understanding what is a front in social media and the ability to connect and influence grandparents through, through millennials to connect on a different way. The paradigm is being shifted. We have to take, take, take it on. And I believe part of it, we just, the PT draws people that are caring and don't like to step on toes and the, our, the skills that make us so good are also the skills that make us unable to take the gloves off and call it and say that is absolutely morally and ethically wrong. And I love the F-bomb this morning, by the way, Karen. That was awesome. I mean, that's just, it's fucking wrong. I mean, you know, and since it's been broken. Uh, and I think when you get, and I, I feel bad, what took so long to find my voice? And you, real, and you begin to look. It took moving to a new place with fresh eyes, new system, and go, why all these scars? Why all this medication? What's going on? And I live in a fabulous place, you know, an affluent place, and a highly edu educated place. And they get sold at. And then you look like what's happening in some of the, you look at our society and where jobs have gone away and people are, hurting for a variety of reasons. And then you got people coming in nefariously and, and, and doing things that's just morally outrageous. So I guess I would say I, there's, we have zero to apologize for, zero. And you know, finally, I think the beauty of having high copays, reimbursements that suck, we have nothing frickin' to lose. I mean, you can piss off any referral source, it don't matter, that is no longer who the hell you're you're working for. You know, why are you even wasting time marketing there? Your marketing is your patience. It's society. And it's being, being confident enough to, to, to say that. And are you going to lose once in a while? You know, we lose. That 95-year-old, she was down and out, but she's back boxing again, you know. So, I mean, you know, we get up, and that's what we do. That's who we are. So, I rambled, but thanks for the question, Kim. Hey, Tim, thanks for the presentation. You made a quote years ago, uh, we're the best profession that no one knows about. And I used to blame the docs, and now what I've learned from going out to medical meetings and speaking, from going to medical schools and speaking, is that docs that know about PT refer to PT. And I've stopped blaming the docs, and I've put the onus on us. We have to go out there and educate them. If we educate them, I'll encourage everyone in here, if you go out there and educate them with every opportunity you can, if you, if you live in a city where you have a medical school, have them shadow in your clinic. If you can go do a two-hour lecture at a medical school, go do it. If you have the opportunity to talk at a medical conference, do it. They aren't taught about physical therapy in medical school. They don't know about us. And if we can go out there and tell them, they will refer to us. Um, so I, would agree. I think we have to take a little bit of the onus. And I think we can. And I agree with you totally on too much surgery, too much drugs. We're the people that can change that. 
And I think you said, you know, new doctors, isn't it interesting how physician pay will be going down as, isn't it interesting our society, physician's pay starts to go down as women start to be more in medicine, right? You know, isn't that a, a common theme we see, right? You know, it's, it's kind of crazy. So medicine is changing, physicians, m m more women, which I think is going to be uh, uh, excellent. And this other thing that's going to be helpful is, again, the millennials, they, they get it too. They're starting to see what the heck's going on. Pharmaceutical industry was the curriculum, you know? So, and they're, you know, that's why being active in social media, our students connecting with young medical students, young n nurse practitioners, nursing, PAs, et cetera, saying, you know, they've been sold a bill of goods as well. You mean, I went eight years of school and I'm supposed to, all I'm supposed to do is give these, this, this, this chemical that's no better than the Mediterranean diet? I mean, yeah, so there, there's frustration uh, across. Yeah, and I'm, I think we need to tap it. I am no fan of the pharmaceutical industry. Um, one other point, though. A lot of doctors now, because malpractice has gotten out of control, are practicing defensive medicine. A lot of the imaging that's done is done defensively. There's a group called the Institute for Legal Reform that estimates we could save $54 billion a year, if, or $54 billion in 10 years, if we had malpractice reform. So, there are other influences that drive these doctors to practice defensive medicine. There's, it's not just, but so I the, just feel like a lot of times we're making the doctors the bad guys. Don't, don't hear me say that. Um, I will say that uh, there's spinal surgeons that are bad guys. I mean, that in, yeah. my, in my neck of the wood, that they literally, and you know, some are not beyond legal stuff, uh, federal but, stuff but going on. But some of them think that is the only answer. Because that's what they've been taught. And if we can get to them, you're I not think you're going to reduce no, that. Data does not change behavior. I've talked with these people. You're not going to change that. That's your livelihood. Don't waste your time. Go to the medical school, I hear you. Go to, the far, go to them and talk to the young people. Do not waste your time trying to convince a spine surgeon to change his Or go to the GP time. so they'll refer okay. them to you instead of the spine surgeon. I'm OK there. I'm yeah. OK there. Yeah. But I mean, just use, you only have so much time in the day, so go where your highest dollar to, uh, value is so that you because some people are not going to change. And the key is just keep them away. Uh, the song is, you know, I didn't coin the term, you know, that often we keep, we really are shepherds keeping the wolves away. John Child said that long ago. And then when Uncle Lucius, that song came, I'm like, oh my God, that's right on. So thanks for that comment. Tim. Um, I thought your speech was just, uh, one of the best I've ever heard. It, it, oh, was, it was tremendous. It hit me uh, very emotional. Um, I'm one of those seniors, okay? Um, and I've had a lot of surgeries. I had uh, the most recent ones were knee replacements. And um, in the hospital, they, they were pushing Oxycontin and Oxycodone. Um, and, you know, I wanted to get off this stuff pretty, I didn't like the effects of it anyways. So when I was in the hospital, uh, I told this young nurse, she probably was 24, 25 years old, I said, listen, can I just take, you know, instead of taking two every four hours, can I just try taking one? Um, and she says, well, and she says, uh, no, you, you know, the doctor says you have to take two. You know, and I was like, you know, I have, I must have four bottles of oxycodone sitting at home that have never been used. Because the only reason I used it after I did come home, um, the okay. only reason I would use oxy, oxy at all was just to get some sleep at night. Your story is very common because it's, it's not that the drug, when it was designed to be used in the hospital based setting and early on, that it, it's fine. Again, appropriate use. It's just, again, it's, I know stories in my hometown. Again, you know, young 20 year olds are given, you know, 30 day supply of this stuff. And again, it's two weeks. To say the brain that it's going to be susceptible to two weeks, you're, you're, you're host. Why are you doing that? So yeah, there's a lot of behavioral changes that need to happen at and, the point. And of the second point that I was going to make, if you notice, you know, when I was still practicing, you know, the, the, the pharmaceutical reps would come around to the doctors, uh, you know, very much the cheerleader types, you know, to come over the docks. And then, uh, they got down on the, the, the pharmaceutical companies. So now what do you see on TV? You see them pushing all of these different types of drugs. They're going through the patient to get the patient to ask the doctor. And, the, you know, the patient puts pressure. Well, you've got to try this, you know, try this on me and this and that on me. You know, and what are the doctors going to do? You know, they're, they're sitting there and they got these patients. 
pushing, pushing through the, the, the yeah, pharmaceuticals. Pre precisely. So don't hear me throwing stones I mean, at physicians. It, it, it's just saying, you know, we have a problem. We have a big part of that solution. And it's, it's multi-pronged, you know, and we can't fix it all, but one person at a time in community. In fact, uh, many of you probably read Dreamland. If not, that's, you, know, listen to, uh, you know, listen on tape or read it. You know, it's really about the opioid epidemic. That, you know, the book group, uh, my wife's book group, just read that on Monday, of all things. And Sue was saying, hey, I got this video coming out. And they're like, oh, oh I want to see it. So she sent it out this morning and, hey, you know, share it with everybody you know and, and to get the conversation going. And in that group, book group of seven people in Fort Collins, Colorado, you know, five deaths were reported within that group of seven folks at the book group. They knew of five different people in our community that I didn't. She didn't know about that it died from, you know, a prescription overdose. So, yeah. Tim, awesome speech. I Thank you. can't put in words how much I appreciate the many concepts and pearls that you presented to this group. Um, having been in the 10 by 10 room treating a lot of chronic pain patients, I've seen a lot of drug abuse. And I think your point, something for all of us clinicians, especially our newer clinicians is listen to the patient, show you care. I can't tell you the number of people that I treat that are a little older than me, and I've treated their children and their grandchildren, and probably one of the worst things I've heard is when their grandchild is 28 years old and they OD'd on an opiate. And they started on marijuana. I know this is controversial, but in my era, I can't tell you the number of people when I went to college in the early 70s that started on marijuana. And I'm a data guy. I won't let that stand. The states have legalized pot. I understand pot. you. I disagree. States yeah. have legalized pot. But, Let's just look but, at the opioid use has gone I, down. I, what, so I data, guys, data. <laughs> what I want to say. Data guys, data. What I want to say, Tim, <laughs> is that listening and showing you care about these patients. And when you hear over and over, in my area, the socioeconomics is very diverse. They started out that way. I'm just trying to say that we as physical therapists have to listen to these people because it's very therapeutic. It's part of the therapeutic alliance, and it might help them get better. Thank you. Thank you so much for a great speech. Thank you. Well, like Bill, I'm part of the Total Joint Replacement Club. <laughs> and I've only had one, though. And it was my hip, and I actually did something stupid that drove bone on bone into bone in bone. So my femur went into the acetabulum. I go in the hospital. I'm in 10-plus pain 24-7 for three months. I go in there. I wake up absolutely pain-free, none whatsoever. And they come in with Percocet. And I said to the nurse, same thing. Look it, I've been in this kind of pain without anything for three months. Why would I want to take it when I'm pain free? She said, well, they cut your muscles in the back and from our experience, the next day, you're going to pay for it if you don't. Stupid me, I take them. What did it buy me? It bought me an extra day in the hospital because I had an impacted bowel from the side effect of constipation. <laughs> And it took a Filipino nurse to come in and say, I'm giving you the triple throwdown. Yep. You're going <laughs> you're to you're get a ducal egg suppository. You're going to get two cups of milk a mag, followed by a prune juice chaser. <laughs> it worked. So anyhow. Yeah. All, all because of those stupid, stupid pills that made me feel goofy, and I didn't even need them. But I want to say this, I think the Academy needs to take this, might have to edit out a couple words, send this to every PT school in the United States and make every student watch it. Can I, can I, can I just ask, I just want a couple things. Number one, I think that was inspired, so thank you Tim Flynn, you. really was. And I don't think we should just send it to our PT schools, how about our congressmen? How about our senators? How about, you know, sitting in front of a congressional group? But the other thing I, I do feel as clinicians, and, and um, <clears throat> pardon me, going back to Dr. Kahn this morning, who are the bad guys here? 
Is it the clinicians? Or do we need to look at the true gatekeepers, the insurance companies, who, not, who would probably create some of that downturn in, in PT visits and Absolutely. tell us because of outcomes? And we need to be fighting the, the, the gatekeepers of the insurance company and teaming with physicians about the problems, because they're all limited to what, 10 minute visits? where a prescription, you can only talk about one, uh, one body region. I mean, they have just as many shackles on them as we do. I would and agree. And I, I think there's some team sort of efforts that could be looked at with this conversation, not just about medication, but about the big picture of care. Absolutely. Thanks so. for that. That's, and, uh, okay. Folks, we're going to take our break till 3.30. Please return, and we'll have Dr. Mark Hancock as our next lecturer.